There is an exciting handheld on the horizon, one that has been in development for quite some time now and will be powered by the MediaTek Helio G99, an ARM SoC that was introduced last year and promises to bring decent performance gains over the Unisoc Tiger T618, a chipset that is quickly becoming the go-to for many retro handheld devices. The KTR1 may finally be arriving at an important inflection point, and Nil, the creator of the KTR1, has sent units out to developers and YouTubers alike for development and review. Being the curious individual that I am, I thought that as we lead up to its eventual ship date, we could take a look at a mobile device that is powered by the same Helio G99 that will be in the KTR1 handheld. So join me, the Retro Tech Dad, as I explore the possibilities and check out a phone that is powered by the Helio G99. Now you might have noticed, but this lovely and poorly printed cardboard KTR1 was created by me and is simply here for the beauty shots. However, this Poco M5 is very real and is the phone that I will be using to run some of our testing for this video. I actually chose this specific model because I was able to get it in a 6GB of RAM, 128GB of storage configuration, which is identical to the configuration of the KTR1 unit that I have personally pre-ordered. The 6GB model in particular is interesting to me because Nil recommends that you go with this configuration as a minimum to do PlayStation 2 emulation. Briefly, the KTR1 will be available in lots of different SKUs with different colors, controller layout, case material, but most importantly in terms of RAM and storage. The cheapest version of the KTR1, which comes in plastic with a 4GB of RAM and 64GB of storage, is being sold for $169 US dollars and goes all the way up to $279 US dollars for the 8GB of RAM and 256GB of storage configuration in Metal. Now quickly going back to this Poco M5, I'll do a quick rundown of the specs of this phone just so we know what we're working with here. Again, I specifically chose this model because it lines up with the version of the KTR1 that I have pre-ordered. This Poco M5 comes with a 6.58 inch, 20 by 9, 90 hertz display, at 1080 by 2408 resolution and is powered by the MediaTek Helio G99 built on a 6 nanometer fab and features two 2.2 gigahertz Cortex A76 cores and six 2 gigahertz Cortex A55 cores. It has the Mali G57 MC2 GPU, six gigabytes of LP DDR4X RAM and 128 gigabytes of UFS 2.2 internal storage. This device ships with Android 12 and the absolutely terrible MIUI 13 out of the box with a 5000 milliamp hour battery that supports 18 watt fast charging. The phone cost me 150 US dollars, which isn't bad for its performance and features. Now please keep in mind that I'm using this device for benchmarking and testing and it is not a review of the product. Okay, so now that we know what device I'm using to check out the Helio G99, let's go over some of the benchmarking numbers available to us. The first thing I like to do is pull up CPU-Z so we can take a look at some of the details of the SoC. As you can see, we have eight cores, two of which are the Cortex a76 and the other six are the Cortex A55 cores with that Mali G57 GPU. You can see I've got the six gigabytes of RAM on here and then I'll look at some other details in CPU-Z. I wanted to pull up side by side with the Unisoc T618, which is definitely going to be a chipset that many will want to see the Helio G99 compared against. You can see that the G99 has that A76 core over the A75 core from the T618. Additionally, it's a much newer SoC having been released just last year, and it is also built on a 6 nanometer fab process versus the 12 nanometer fab for the T618. The Helio G99 is clocked slightly higher on its cores and it does seem to support a higher RAM capacity, which the KTR1, as I mentioned, will have models available in 4, 6, and 8GB RAM configurations. We've got LP DDR4X RAM with the G99 with a TDP of 5 watts and that Mali G57, which should be a decent improvement over the G52. So let's now run some synthetic benchmarks and I will begin first with Geekbench 6 and get a sense of the CPU performance. Now as you can see, based on the benchmark scores, no surprises here, but the Helio G99 is outperforming the Unisoc T618 and I wanted to include the Odin Lite with its Dimensity 900 because it is available for $199 on that base model of 4GB with 64GB of storage. So I conducted the same test on my own Odin Lite to pull these numbers. I think it will give us a good representation of where the Helio G99 stands between the Unisoc T618 and the Dimensity 900. Now it's a pretty similar story when we head over to the Antutu 
benchmark. And you can see that the G99 is giving us a similar performance boost over the T618 with about a 70% increase. And finally, the 3 mark wildlife test with the T618 coming in at 743, the G99 coming in at 1244, and finally the Odin Light coming in at 1959. The G99 has about a 67% increase in performance over the T618, and so based on these three benchmarks, we can see that overall the G99 is a solid 60-70% to more powerful over the T618 across the board. Now how does this all translate to real world performance? Well, first let's check out some native Android gaming. And one nice thing about this device is that it is on Android 12 and so I am able to turn on the performance counter and we can get these awesome readouts in game which is really useful for benchmarking. I'll start with Gunfire Reborn since it has a built in frame counter and we will be able to compare between the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus and the Helio G99 and see how it fares with its FPS. For Gunfire Reborn, I turn the settings on both devices to high to really try to push them. Over on the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus, the device is definitely struggling to hit 60 frames per second, whereas the Helio G99 is faring better and staying at, at or very close to that 60 frames per second target. I do apologize for the off-screen footage, I usually record both captured and off-screen gameplay, but I did not want to use any screen recording to impact the frame rates for this game and all the footage you will be seeing in this video. Alright, here is a quick little test of performance in Fortnite just to see how things are running here. I've set Fortnite to medium quality preset with that FPS cap of 30. The in-game counter is showing that the G99 is maintaining pretty close to that 30 frames per second during most points in the game, so again, pretty decent performance on the Android side. Finally, I wanted to test performance with Genshin Impact since it is a popular benchmarking game on the Android side. I've set the game to the low preset and this game is pretty much staying at its 30 FPS target. I do believe this is better performance than I've tested with the Unisoc T618. Okay, let's get to emulation, and really, if you are considering a KTR1, it's probably the topic that you care about most. So let's take a look at PlayStation 2 emulation first. For lower end hardware, I usually use the PAL versions of PS2 games to test Ether SX2. Up first is Burnout 3, and this game is always a tricky one to run. Now, I did not use the speed patch that is available for this game, but I wanted to see how it runs without going to that next step. You can see that Burnout 3 isn't perfect, but personally, I was quite surprised by the performance. It's a definite improvement over the T618. Now for this game, I did have to set the EE cycle rate to minus one and the EE cycle skip to one to get the performance that you are seeing here. The other thing worth noting is that the CPU is in fact being pushed to its max clocks on all cores. I don't think the camera was able to pick this up, but it's good to see that we are using the power available to us. Now let's move on to Jack and Daxter. Neil actually provided footage of this game running on a KTR1 unit, so I wanted to test Jack and Daxter for my Myself. Based on his footage, it does appear that he has the underclocking set to minus one and one, but in my footage, I actually did not underclock at all, but instead, using the PAL version, you can see that I'm getting pretty decent performance. I think this is quite promising in terms of PS2 emulation. Another game I wanted to test was God of War 2, and again, using the PAL version of God of War 2, and similar to Jack and Daxter, I did not set any type of underclocking, and the PAL version of God of War 2 is doing quite well on this device. It's not the absolute perfect experience, but it is better than what we have seen on the T618 devices, and we are seeing that synthetic benchmarks are showing up here in emulation. Yeah! 
Lastly, I wanted to briefly show Shadow of the Colossus, and the reality is that this game is just brutal to run for a lot of devices, and not a lot really changes here, unfortunately. I did try different tweaks, and this does appear to be about as good as it will get on this Poco M5, and realistically, I think many aren't expecting Shadow of the Colossus to be playable on the KTR1, as it's a game that struggles on many devices. So let's move on to GameCube emulation, and I think, like PS2, a lot of viewers will be curious to see how the Helio G99 will perform compared to the Unisoc T618. Right off the bat, I will say that it's obviously performing better, as should be expected from it. So first up, let's start with something like Wave Race Blue Storm, and here, just using Dolphin for handheld pulled from a Retro Pocket 3 Plus, the game is performing quite well using the PAL version at 50 frames per second and native resolution. Let's try out some Metroid Prime next, and Nil uploaded footage of Metroid Prime running on an actual KTR1 unit, and so this gives us an opportunity to compare my results with his, and you can see that the Poco M5 with the Helio G99 is performing very similar to what Neil presented here. I think with some additional tweaks, this one is what I would consider to be playable on here. Finally, I want to take a look at F-Zero GX, which I think is the perfect example of where we can go from the T618 to the Helio G99. F-Zero GX does not perform well in the Retro Pocket 3 Plus without some heavy tweaking and significant overclocking. So first, I wanted to show footage of F-Zero GX running here on the Poco M5 without the overclock applied. You can see that the PAL version of F-Zero GX is getting up there, but doesn't quite stay at full speed consistently, and mostly hovers around 80% speed. Now let's quickly go and turn on the override emulated CPU clock speeds, and I will set this to 150%. So let's head back into F-Zero GX, and now this game gets that little boost it needs to stay much closer to its 50 FPS target. Something like the Retro Pocket 3 Plus would need a much larger overclock, which then really starts to break other things in game like the audio. So GameCube performance overall is a definite improvement and looking pretty decent. But how about some Wii while we have Dolphin for handheld open? I decided to take a look at Super Mario Galaxy because again, this is a game that Neil had provided footage of running on a KTR1 unit. I have to say I am quite pleased with the performance of the Helio G99 with this game. It's running quite well and will occasionally have a dip, but this is really awesome to see and I think we will be able to expand on the playable list of games for Wii coming from the T618. Finally, for fun, I wanted to test Uncharted Golden Abyss on Vita 3K, and surprisingly Nil provided footage of this one running at or near 30 frames per second on the actual KTR1, so I decided to check this one out myself, and I did see similar results. The frame rate definitely dropped during gunfights, but personally, Vita isn't a platform I'm really looking to play on something like the KTR1, and Vita 3K is still very early in development, but again, I just wanted to include some footage for fun. Okay, so with that, I think we've touched upon some of the capabilities of this Helio G99. Now, I do want to say that this was done purely for fun, and it is not meant to be definitive or indicative of the final performance of the KTR1. I am just trying to get a feel of where we could possibly land in terms of performance by using this Poco M5. Now, it is very possible that with some tweaks in the software side, we could see slightly better performance than I've displayed here, and I think there's a lot to look forward to. I don't quite think that this will be the PS2 handheld under $200 that many have dreamt of, but it's certainly moving us in the right direction. Unfortunately, the KTR1 is 
is up against some decent competition, with devices that are powered by the T618 coming in below the price of even a base KTR1. The issue is that Nil does recommend the 6GB version for PlayStation 2 emulation, so with that, we are looking at something like $199 US dollars to get into that model. If you are looking at the best possible performance for under $199 US dollars, the KTR1 will not be it, unfortunately, and you might consider the $199 Odin Lite. However, the KTR1 does have a few advantages for a potential buyer, and that comes down to its 3x2 aspect ratio display, layout options, choice of either a plastic or metal shell, and lastly, its compact size. The KTR1 is slightly larger than something like the RG405M, but definitely comes in smaller than the Odin Lite, and so if power and compactness are a priority, the KTR1 starts to look very appealing. The other issue, of course, is that we really just don't know if the KTR1 will ship as planned or in a reasonable amount of time, and we will just have to wait and see if the review units end up in the developers and YouTubers' hands in the next week or two, with retail units going out to customers hopefully sometime after that. There are definite logistical concerns with the KTR1, and I believe Nil has stated that he has 180 different SKUs between all the variations available. Now, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but a few months ago, I did a similar video for the MiU P60 and took a look at the Helio P60, and well, that handheld has disappeared at this point. I'm worried that by publishing this video, I might have actually cursed the KTR1, but I guess time will tell, and we will have to see in a few months if this product will actually ship. And with that, I want to thank you so much for joining me on this fun video exploring the Helio G99 and seeing what kind of power we could potentially expect with the KTR1. The next chip I plan to explore will be the Intel i3-1215U, and I should be back soon enough with that video. As always, I am the Retro Tech Dad, and thank you so much for watching.